So I'm here today with um, Peter Hugh Marshall, and he's a well-known anarchist. He's an author, historian, a biographer, and poet. He's written about 15 published works, and they've 17, been in fact. 17 now. 17 now, yes. <laughs> ah, right. So 17 published works in about 14 languages. Uh, yes, they've been translated into 15. Right? Into 15 yes, yeah. languages. Think different languages. And they include everything from uh, biographies of William Blake, a uh, famous um, anarchist, and uh, other famous anarchists like uh, William Godwin. Uh, Peter's written the definitive uh, history of anarchy called uh, Demanding the Impossible. And... His uh, range includes going all the way from ecology, uh, books uh, like Nature's Web, and examining, I think, the relationship to anarchy and, and ecology, which is quite a strong one, isn't yes, it? Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, recently, he's come out with a book called uh, Poseidon's Realm, and that's a book about sailing and the mythology of Greece, kind of pretty much the stuff I've been doing in my videos, too. Um, he's visited Gobekli Tapi and written about the Menelaths and uh, Menas, uh, Megaliths and Menas in, in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I hope to talk about that um, at some stage. And uh, yeah, everything from things like Cuba Libre about uh, the experience in Cuba, which is relevant to kind of uh, Duma uh, scenarios, disaster scenarios. Um, and then his latest book is. Uh, called uh, Bognor Boy, um, How I Became an Anarchist. And uh, so, so welcome, Peter. Thank you. Yes. The last book, by the way, is an uh, 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 autobiography, a memoir, from, from my uh, birth, which was 1946, to, 90, to, to my age of 24, to about 1970. Oh. So that includes my upbringing in, uh, in uh, Bognor Regis, on, on the south coast of England, and then going to sea um, as a cadet in a piano company, went around the world then, mm -hmm. and then that was I went. I spent a year uh, in in West Africa in Senegal, teaching English to francophone students, and then I came back to England. And I thought there'd be truth, enlightenment to be discovered in universities. <laughs> I did in the, in the end. I did three degrees. I did a M, first degree, M, a BA, an MA, and then a PhD. My PhD was based on the philosophy of William Godwin. Yeah. It, and then uh, that was turned into a, a, a biography, uh, intellectual biography, which was published by Yale University Press. Right. Okay. So now that you... launched me. At the same time, I did a launched me as a writer because at the same time I did a, a, a quite a popular travel book with two photographers, Mohammed Amin and Duncan Woodes, called Into well, a, a, a Journey Through Tanzania. Yeah. And uh, so, in a way, they were, they were, one was very academic and uh, intellectual, and the other was much more relaxed and involved in journey around Tanzania and Africa. Um, so, did you? Uh, you also did a, a documentary for NYT, I think, about uh, sailing around Africa. Yes, it was uh, actually it was for HTV. HTV, yeah. But it's been been uh, I think it's been passed on to various other yeah. um, TV networks. And that was that, that was took me nine months to actually travel around Africa. I was basically started in in uh, in Portugal when the first navigators left um, Europe, uh, and to find a wet passage around South Africa up towards mm. India. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I went to see really the relationship which within between Europe and Africa in the last five hundred years. Because my wife was actually from my first wife, who unfortunately recently died, was. Um, from the Afro Caribbean, she was born there. But she grew up in France. She was born in, in Martinique, and uh, so my children are mixed race. Um, but uh, I, and I want to come to terms with this relationship between Europe and Africa. Oh, very interesting. Okay, so now you mentioned that you were forty. You were born in nineteen forty-six. Yes. So that's really one of the first years to be called a baby boomer. I was born in nineteen sixty-five, so I'm one of the last years of the baby boomers. So we kind of bookends yes. on the baby boomer generation. Yeah. And yeah. what I'd like to ask you is, 
what should the baby boomer generation be saying to say the millennials and the next generations, what some people are calling the last generation, based on where we've got to in this, yes. uh, the planet and collapse? Mm. What um, what do you think? If you could, you know, take the microphone yes, and be yes. the voice of yeah. our generation, yes. should be saying to the millennials. Well, first, I think our generation after the Second World War should really apologise. And for making such a mess of the environment and of the plants. And that's, I mean, in the 60s, I and others tried to improve society, get a more just, egalitarian and free society. We, we were very much involved with the 60s movements. And then, then uh, I became aware of what we were doing to the environment in the 70s and 80s. And that's when I, at the end of the 80s, early 90s, I wrote um, Nature's Web. Mm-hmm. So the two aspects, really, of my work was... Uh, was trying to, to create a, or at least raise consciousness about the possibility of an anarchist, anarchist society which was more egalitarian, just, free and ecological and at the same time uh, be aware of, become more aware of how we had, in particular in the West, had to conquered and destroyed the planet. So although, although I personally in my own life had tried to, to avoid this this uh, disaster, that is nevertheless a result, I think, of the baby boomers. But they mm. they have had never had it so good, as it were. They've had uh, like they've retired now on large pensions. They've lived as if and they've consumed vast resources, and they continue to do so until they until they will die. They pass on their children and their grandchildren uh, a world which is a very difficult world. Or it could become increasingly difficult. I don't sh- share the view that we've had it, but I think uh, that it's going to be very serious and very difficult for for the uh, for the next generations, the rising generations. Yeah, in particular in the poorer nations that are developing, the populous poorer nations like India and China. Yes, are late to the party, and uh, they they want to catch up where there just probably isn't enough. Resources that, to support true. that. Yeah, that's true. They want they, they want to they want to um, have the Western lifestyle, which is impossible because uh, they will require at least four times resources which the planet can offer. So they're in a way trying to do the impossible. I mean, some people in the West are trying to live a more ecological life, more in balance with nature, but in the long term, that 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 the hum, human beings seem to be very very closely doomed if they don't quickly change direction. But although there are young, particularly the young people, are coming increasingly aware of the and uh, uh, of of the problems, and they are trying to do something about it. But it's more like a rear guard action. And uh, the mainstream, the baby boomers, and those who follow their their steps, will, in the end, not only lead to severe um, uh, natural de- degradation, but to planetary disaster. Now, the thing is, though, that the solution that's offered by baby boomers, particularly economists and yeah. baby boomers, is that we reach a plateau and everything works when everybody has a certain standard of living. So we've spent a century with this um, ideology saying that, well, if you just get people to have a standard of living that looks something like a Westerner, then you get negative population growth, you get a plateau, you get them, you know, you get up to five thousand um, dollars a year uh, income, and then people start caring about the environment, and they can't do that while they're poor. So the whole effort is to get people to the status where they stop breeding, um, then you know they become intellectual and. Um, consumerists, and then it's it all works out. But the problem is, though, isn't it, that we cap out at something like four planets worth if yes. you add China and India. Yes. Um, for, uh, the, there's all very well, to, but I think it's maybe the case in certain countries in Europe, the actual population is declining, uh, particularly, I think, in, in uh, Italy, Catholic country, Germany, country, yeah. Germany yeah. Spain, uh, and also Spain, yeah. and the, these countries, so that, and also in, in Japan, the same. That if we are highly industrialized societies with many consumer goods, that the population can go down, which is a, is like suggestion that to, to Malthus, the beginning of the nineteenth century, uh, that 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 is not inevitable conflict between 
population and uh, and uh, resources. But in fact, that that's just on, only within Europe and, and parts of the Far East. But if everybody tries to sit, live like we do in the West, in America and in Europe, then then uh, it, it's impossible. Yeah, but especially in Simply Africa. Simply are not resources, yes. I mean, Africa's population is growing way too yes, fast yes, and yeah. they, they will overshoot, you know, um, way too much for for anybody to get that standard of living. So the, the conclusion is, the message I would say to the, um, the next generations is expect a lower standard of living. You've got to get over the idea of growth. You've got to get over this guaranteed prosperity. The future is always brighter. It's like that's the past now. Well, that was you 19th look, century. Yeah, it's it's progressivism, belief, isn't it? The belief in, in progress through technological innovation. And that uh, now it seems uh, um, increasingly unlikely that we're now not progressing anymore, I don't think. And even though there are countries like certain parts of Africa and uh, India and China want to catch up with the West, or I wouldn't say catch up, but they were further West in their folly, they, they, uh, they, they, they would just make things worse. And there's also a, a huge problem of the climate change, which will affect people in these countries, in particular, hot countries in particular. In particular. Yeah, they, and they, they want to migrate and they will want to... Uh, to, to sh share the, the, what they see as a wonderful way of life in, 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 in the West. Yeah, they, they've just issued a, a heat warning for, for Europe this week. So they're mm. trying to avoid a 2003 style um, die off of thousands. But we're well, certainly we're now in Greece and it's, a, it's beginning of a very hot day. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I'm told uh, it's, they're expecting 38 degrees here. And, and, uh, it was 35 uh, yesterday. Yes, yeah. and it's a good part of next week. Uh, India's hit 50. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, the, the idea that, well, you can see just just in that. And then, so let's move the conversation on to, the, to that. Because the, in India, when it went to 50 degrees, mm -hmm. basically anybody, uh, anybody that had air conditioning was mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. But you're in this kind of feedback loop where, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're, uh, they're consuming more and more energy mm -hmm. as more and more people get uh, air conditioning. Mm -hmm. But the, pe the people at the bottom are the people that's going to suffer. So exactly. once again, this is riddled with unfairness. Not yes, only yeah. are the poorer nations going to suffer, the poor, the poor within our nations, at the bottom yes. of the hierarchy, um, the rich who consumed all the resources yes. get off scot-free and consume even more, coping with the problems they created by using more energy, for example, to use air conditioning, which is a great example. Yeah. So that social inequality now, there's that. Yeah, I think it's true to say, from an anarchic point of view, is to say that would never have happened unless we'd centralized. Um, if we'd stayed distributed, we we hadn't got these kind of um, mass agriculture and stuff like that. Um, so, but what happens now if you if you're an anarchist and you say, well, you know, the Green New Deals and all that are, are completely you know, mystical thinking, they're just magical thinking, because, you know, the, the idea that we can hyper-industrialize yeah. our way out of an industrial problem is mm -hmm. just is just crazy. Yeah. Well, uh, so but that's the bill we're being sold. But what's the anarchist point of view of unwinding this huge phantasmagoria of uh, well, insanity? There's a, the, there's a huge inequality, in the, in not only within societies, but with, with in the, on the planet, in the world. And uh, it's said that the one percent of the population own ninety-nine percent of the wealth. So I think if that's more fairly distributed, that that it could possibly uh, make the poorer people uh, more able to survive you know, and 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 uh, and, uh, and to, re uh, to to live a reasonable life, a certain amount of well-being. But it's not, from my own experience, that it's not just. The ownership of consumer goods or property, which actually brings you happiness, it's just living a life in which you feel is is fulfilling and meaningful, and that can be done by a peasant, you know, in a in a, in a uh, on a small patch of land, probably more mm. likely that uh, I think than uh, in a sort of traditional way of life than someone living in, in the city, who's a you know, who's employed by one of these huge firms who now have. They have uh, the 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 wealth of uh, which is greater than some nations, such yeah, as Microsoft, exactly. such as Apple, Mac, 
such as Amazon, Exxon, yeah, Exxon, yeah. and they, 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 they're particularly the American companies, but they, 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 they have a huge control, and, and particularly uh, they're claiming it's intellectual rights property to their inventions, which now people can't use. I mean, as, uh, in the, for instance, <laughs> I, I believe the iPhone costs about six hundred pound, then but it actually, to, 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 to buy on the market, but. It, to manufacture in China um, by Apple Mac, it, it, it costs one fifty. So yeah. the difference is is actually taken as profit by by uh, Apple Mac. Yeah, it's a lo and also in assembling an iPhone, very little of that profit goes to China. Yes, yeah, exactly. So yes, the, yes. most of it, the final assembly is done in Germany, and the mm -hmm. the the major part of an yeah. of an Apple. Um, icon, I call it, is uh, <laughs> yeah. um, it goes to to German workers that mm -hmm. do the final assembly. So yeah. you know the the very menial tasks obviously have a very menial mm -hmm. um, uh, profit margin. So yeah, yeah. it's I mean, un unfair all the way down. Yeah. But but now take the guys who are the CEOs of these mm. uh, multi uh, multinationals. Yeah. Yeah. Now. These guys have a lot of power. I mean, yeah. it, I mean, it would be an understatement to say they have the world in their pocket. Um, now, what is Anarchist's solution to that? Because it's, I would call it the perennial problem of anarchy, and I would characterize it like maybe some anarchists might object to. They normally say sociopaths, but you know, I say if you look at these guys, they're psychopaths. They fulfill the clinical definition, according to Robert Hare's list of psychopathy. Um, and so I said, just call them psychopaths. But if you take guys like, you know, Trump and mm. Bolton and Pompeo and these guys like Dick Cheney and Madeleine Albright and uh, Angela Merkel and uh, Hillary Clinton, they're all pathologically diagnosable as, um, as psychopaths. Uh, and clearly they, they don't have the smarts, they don't have a vision for an anarchic utopia. What do you do with those? I mean, you, you, you can't put them on Mars. They have a huge amount of power. Um, what the, in a nutshell, what do we do with the psychopaths? Well, um, well, you call them psychopaths, uh, which is, I think, clinically defined as someone who's cruel, enjoys cruel cruelty. Yeah, uh, one, one of the who, traits. And also yeah. no, com, no, compassion, no, no compassion. Narcissism. Yeah, yeah. narcissism, etc. So it may be the case that some of these people do not all. I don't think you know. It's, it's a question of degree. Yeah, but but, uh, but also yeah. the uh, but they certainly so so show certain traits, which which are in 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 inimical to the rest of the population. You know, who mm -hmm. the ninety nine percent of the world's population who don't have the wealth they do. In fact, they control it. So so from an anarcho point of view. That uh, I mean, just, I'm dismissing what I would call anarcho-capitalism, which, which is doesn't probably, exist. Probably, <laughs> which, 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 some of the extreme right would like to see that, where everything, yeah. no government, no state, everything reduced to just private property and security firm to protect it. Yeah, free markets. Yeah. But and free uh, market and free markets. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I probably trumps that sort of then. But the Libertarian yeah. Party in America, I think, is. Adopting some of these views and extreme right in uh, in, in in Britain is, mm -hmm. but the the it, so I was say that sort of anarchism which I would adopt would adopt and recommend is a form of social anarchism, where we can move from uh, the necrocene, which I would say reckon is part of the present world where we the present e epoch epoch the, and the, I, I, you've said before that the Anthropocene is the Shortest epoch of all of them. Yes, and it'll shortly be followed by the Necrocene, which is the last and longest. <laughs> and I've actually just written an introduction to a book by John Clark called uh, uh, "Between Empire, Between Earth and Empire," and from the Necrocene to the beloved community. Uh, some say it might be utopian, but there are examples in a world where people are trying to, to develop a more democratic, more egalitarian. A more just way of life, close to nature, which is an example of how we could possibly live, and uh, that if we don't know that we just just be increasing necro uh, de death and the necrosine, increasing the, the degradation not only of the planet but the 
the, the killing of other species, which we've seen very much, and uh, particularly the Extinction Rebellion have tried to, 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 to raise that awareness. But wherever you look in, in the world, that, that, that there are increasing wild, decreasing wild animals and increasing domestic animals. And that's a huge problem in itself. So I think that we must, we have to, certainly the next generation, I'm 972, so in a way, uh, I, the, I, but I'm, I've tried in my books to, aware, to raise awareness, conscious about these issues, but they ha have to do something or we are doomed. Yeah. I think we're doomed. <laughs> <laughs> That's your view, right? I, I, I'm well, slightly more hopeful that, because there are lots of particularly the young people I, I've met and contact me, that they definitely try to do something about it. They, they know the problems and they try and live in a, in a much more ecological uh, way of li life, consuming much less. But that has to be transferred to, to the majority population. Yeah. And I've just recently met, met a young man who got a PhD in at Oxford, very bright, and but immediately he's been his first job is in Microsoft, in London, on Cambridge. In fact. That's that's the end of him. So uh, the, how many brilliant minds have been lost to work? Yeah, and I said to him, <laughs> I said to him, does it? What well, that fine, but does it tax your brain? And it, <laughs> no, he, no, it doesn't. <laughs> it so, taxes my wallet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So he he would get get a very high income, and just increase Microsoft's power over the world. Yeah, I would never sell out like that, at least no. not for more than about the three decades that I did that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't do any more than about three decades well, of selling out for being an engineer for the, money. You know about it from the inside. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've spent uh, all that time kind of working for against the system, kind of thinking, well, you're hostage, sure, but I'm trying to work against it from the inside and yeah. I tried to become an, you know, an uh, eco entrepreneur and find out, you know, but each yeah. time I did, you know, kind of get more and more into doing something about the system, the more I realized how how impossible it is and how deeply entrenched and how fraudulent it is. So being an you know, eco entrepreneur introduced me to the fact that there's no recycling going on. It's a huge fraud, just like in um, you know in the UK when uh, during the war Beaverbrook um, got this propaganda campaign going the you know pots and pans to yeah. make spitfires yeah. and everybody bought into it because I mean you can't take pots and pans very low grade aluminium like 50 53 aluminium and it has to be at least be 60 61 aluminium for for the aircraft industry and yeah. Britain didn't have smelter so it was a complete fraud yes but I've told Britons, you know, that lived through the war and have collected pots and pans that not a single one of those went into a Spitfire. You know, the the, the iron railings and everything they took went straight into the Thames. They were just dumped there. There's nothing they could do with them. But they, it was such good propaganda because they they absolutely believed to the point of spitting and walking out the room that their pots and pans went into Spitfires, even though it was just technically, I mean, you could just, you know, sp uh, metallurgist could tell you, aircraft engineer, pilot could tell you it's not happening. Uh, and they're doing the same thing, that same kind of propaganda now. Uh, and it's really just to keep people's consumer spirits up. Exactly. Uh, or in the war to keep their spirit up. Uh, the fighting spirit. Spirit, yeah, but this is the fighting yeah. spirits all the way down in the end of species party that we're going to keep yeah. on shopping. You know, after 9-11, yeah. then Bush was keep on shopping. So we have yeah. this keep on shopping culture yes. and this propaganda to keep it going. So well, the people for an example of, of the power of social media, even yeah. during that period in the 1940s and 30s, actually before, but he he was a sort of newspaper mogul who Beaver controlled Brook, yeah. people's minds. Beaverbrook, yeah, Beaverbrook yeah. did, yes. Yeah, yeah. So he uh, so that's that's what Blake called the mind forged manacles. You know, people mm -hmm. actually become mental slaves. There's almost a voluntary servitude where where people believe that what they're doing is a good thing. So it's when not fact, only it's the it's cycle cycle. It shows the, con the, the control, of, I would say, of, of, of the media and the state and the government, of its populace. My father, for instance, during the war, was a, was a fighter pilot, a Spitfire fighter pilot. And uh, you know, he, said, he said they were made, they got Spitfires, the first Spitfires were just made canvas and wood. They were, well, hurricanes were just canvas and yes, wood. Yes, right? he, yeah. he also flew a hurricane. But the, 
this, the, the whole idea that pots would suddenly be turned into 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 a really good good um, uh, uh, aircraft was a complete myth. Yeah, and we we so live with so many myths. What, what and the, the, the people pay, don't in particular, the, 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 the consumerism though. will bring happiness yeah. and materialism. It does not, from my experience. I mean, I've I've I've, loved, I've been fortunate, I suppose, or, to have grew up in a in a in a fairly middle class, well off family, but right from then, in which my parents, my and my grandparents, and my uh, my uh, uncles, they were all right wing Tory capitalists. And they made considerable amount of wealth, um, and I suppose I had it quite easy when I was young. But I just realised the dangers of, of this way of life, and I reacted against it. And mainly through uh, when I went to sea, I just saw these these wealthy these millionaires being part of the first class of piano. And they were so boring, and their lives were so empty, and they so dominated their women. I this, and so very early on, I I I realised that wealth doesn't bring happiness. Doesn't bring. You can see it. They're not. Yes, happy. I can see it. Yeah. But it may, maybe people have don't have have not been born into that situation that they think wealth and power will bring them happiness. But it doesn't. Yeah, but it, it's a, it's a drug though. So yes, I yes. I grew up privileged. Just I mean, even if you're middle class white person in South Africa with yes. apartheid, uh, you were privileged. I had you know. Servants. Uh, we had three gardeners, yes. two housemaids, <laughs> and uh, that was that yeah. was normal for yeah. a middle class family in Africa, in all of colonial white. Africa. Yeah. If you're yeah. white, yeah, and you know every, and so yeah, it was a life of living the Raj, you know, and mm. so. Um, uh, but it's a drug because then uh, people can't imagine not living like that so the the mm. idea once you start thinking of us and them and thinking of them kind of like animals uh, what you're saying is if you remove the wealth we become animals mm -hmm. and in the in the mind of the you know i'm speaking from experience yes. knowing the the psychology of the rich yes. and and powerful in these things um so uh it they would commit suicide rather than being degraded to poor mm. so even though they're not happy it's the it's the lifestyle, um, they, they can't imagine themselves out mm. of that lifestyle or any other. So in South Africa, they took up the gun to defend their utopia. Mm. Of course, immediately when you t pick up a gun to defend u utopia, it's not new to utopia anymore, it's a dystopia, and, it's, uh, mm. and that's exactly what they did. They never saw, right up until maybe 1994, uh, when the first black government came into South Africa, they never saw that the irony of destroying utopia by picking up a gun to save it. Mm. And so the thing deteriorated, it became more and more obvious that, you know, defending the first class dining car with machine guns and bombs and planes mm. um, was was not utopia. But the idea that they could always get back to it somehow. And that's why you get the MAGA thing with, you know, it's the return to the 50s. We, we can wind back to the clock where we were on top. But the whole machine is is degenerating as we go, and the chances that we can get back are almost zero. Right? We can't get back to the what you enjoyed and I enjoyed, can we? Well, could we were part of this baby boomer generation, yeah, in which we so called never had it so good. In the sense, never had it so good in the sense we we consume, we have wealth, and uh, but from my own experience, I realised quite early on how empty these things are. Yeah. Not the end, and, but the problem partly is is the poor nations and poor people think they if they have this wealth and power, uh, particularly the wealth, they will somehow be happier. And the grass is green on the yeah, other side of the fence, isn't it? Doesn't yeah. follow. Doesn't follow at all. In fact, yeah. and not only is it impossible, given that given the the amount of resources the rich, as we said earlier, consume, but uh, it's not actually it's not only not only impossible, but it's also not very desirable. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I uh, would argue, yeah. as I have done, that a much more egalitarian free society is more likely to, to enable uh, people to live lives which are fulfilled. It's very simple. And the, I think the major, major uh, what in the 19th century, or the early anarchist thinkers, that they saw the main obstacles was this very dominating church and state, and, mm -hmm. and, and then a government 
which actually works on behalf of the state. The state continues where governments change. Nowadays, it's, it's, uh, you, with transnational uh, uh, um, companies, it's beyond individual states and nations. But, but so their, their power and wealth has to be, has to be curbed. And uh, you can either do it through, um, mm-hmm. through sort of mass disobedience uh, or through raising consciousness, which, which I have tried to do, raise, raising consciousness to my books and to my personal actions. Uh, um, or you can take up a gun, but I don't think uh, taking up a gun it solves anything. So I would tend to support the non-violent um, uh, direction. Yeah, I'm, well, yeah, the violence thing, I, th- I think... It's not personal violence, which involves killing other people or, or other human beings. Yeah. I mean, it, obviously that's desirable, just from a compassionate point of view. But I'm, I'm increasingly thinking it's, it's not practical. The, what the obstacles we face in the, in the world is, uh, as we head for collapse, I mean, it's, it's just privileged talk to say we can go through collapse without uh, you know being being non-violent you you know it's basically suicidal um at the very least isn't it well you said earlier that the 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 violence which you experienced in south africa both of the whites and the blacks um the africans was actually made things worse rather than better and although there's been a since since yeah, uh, um, since, since the, the ANC came to power in South Africa, there, there's been a black elite which has emerged. Yeah. The vast majority of people live live in great poverty, live in the shanty towns. Well, you see, that it depends on who the violence is directed against. So that was one violent system against another violent yes. system. It was replaced by one. But you said but it nobody became more de- 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 degenerated. It with, did with de- degenerate. Yeah. 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 But but the thing is, what. Uh, in a revolution, then yes. basically you are fighting against uh, and using violence against the people that are setting up these systems. So it's it's uh, you know basically uh, it's the equivalent of saying like, well we mustn't go to war because you know we'll be in the trenches and we'll have you know Tommies that are working class people fighting working class Germans from yeah. a German factory. And you say yeah of course I'm not talking about you know violence against work fellow workers i'm talking about shooting the officers if if both the 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 tommies and the germans shoot the officers that's it we can play football in no man's land after that <laughs> but who is going to shoot the officers the, well that's the, the people, question <laughs> yes <laughs> when many, many people uh, try this by assassination yes of, the, uh, of, of dictators propaganda of the yes. deed yeah, not yeah. only uh, not only anarchists I mean, although anarchists have been Painted with that brush, but it's far more violent assassination and ter- so-called terrorism has been been uh, perpetrated by monarchists, nationalists, by by um, uh, they they would because because they do in defence of, of of a state and and their own wealth and power that they they they, uh, they apply it to the anarchists. In fact, if you look at the history of anarchism. It's a very small, and at the end of the 19th century, largely, with uh, uh, bombing and assassination, and that was in desperate situations. And that also, some say, it was, was a result of argent provocateur, the state yes, that encouraged yes. certain people, desperate workers, to take extreme action. So that they could be condemned yes, and so they would legitimise violence a, by the yes, state. So yeah. it's a classic thing that, uh, which has been done in Africa with the civil wars, where where they they actually that the, those in power create violence amongst the opposition, who are then blamed for violence, yeah, it's and then then then, then, then who, 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 who attacked. Yeah, it continual tactic. Yes. But all the but uh, yeah, be, me and others have been trying to tell you know one of the things about things like now everybody's woken up kind yes, of thing. Yeah. The, the next generation. Yeah. There's this. Um, kind of, they, they're kind of naive as a, you know, as activists, and so me and amongst other people have been trying to say these things, like the drone attack um, at Heathrow, 
is you know you got to watch out that that's not uh, a jump provo provocateur stuff mm. because that's exactly the kind of tactic they would use to yeah. do something that they know is going to be unpopular and then they can condemn the movement and everybody's cheering it on saying no we've got to do this kind of thing and say mm. no you're falling right into what the you know the MI5 and you know the CIA yes. would would do as a false flag operation yeah, but, uh, so that, that, I, I, that's why I don't support non uh, violent action. I think yeah. that uh, I do think the civil disobedience is is uh, more more the way forward and more likely to achieve its ends. But if there's, if there's enough people who who refuse to cooperate with the powers in, in the authorities in power, then I think it, it makes a, a whole nation ungovernable, ungovernable. And some so some have tried through the general strike uh, up until to the uh, Spanish Civil War in the 19th century in particular, and in, in prison in the 1920s. They they but then there's some are collaborators. It's difficult, very difficult. Well, well, that's but the whole thing. What I have against XR now, the XR leadership, is they collaborating with the government. So it went mm. to you know, went from you know when action, I mean when hope dies, action begins, and then the you know as if enough people you know. Um, do civil disobedience, then we become ungovernable, and then, you know, two seconds later, it was you know selling all this opium and talking to the guys in government and saying, mm. oh, we've got to X our business and we've got to collaborate with business to see mm. if there was a solution, and then you know they're backing all the government plans now for, for things um, like clean growth strategies yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. And said like, that's not making the country ungovernable by civil disobedience. Mm. It's politics. And so, uh, mm. you know, I think that um, it's, it's, we should be attacking the financial industry. We should be sucking the oxygen, you know, out of the system that, that underpins it. And, right. But and, uh, it's, it's such a, a draw for people to, to um, assume that we can have our cake and eat it. So we can transition, we can have electric cars, and even, even though you know, the Natural History Museum yeah. just recently came out with an open letter saying, replacing all the cars in Britain now would take more of the neodymium than the world produces by twice. It would be, mm -hmm. you know, um, all, all the rare earth metals, um, cobalt and things like that, would, would be the world supply of lithium, cobalt, yes. to lithium, just to get started yeah, on other things. Yes, so we can't transition to anything. It's, I, it's I would agree with you, but yeah. some people believe this te te technological fix will somehow <coughs> enable us to continue the way of consumer's way of life. Now it's talking about mining other plants. Which is things. also so, ridiculous because the cost would just be astronomical. Yes. So I thought Literally. also I've thought the whole whole idea of, or even of sustainable development is a myth because it's a contradiction in terms because something which de de development from progress cannot be sustained. Yeah. Exactly. So that, rather than rather than sustainable development, I would say more of a U turn. Or, 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 a move, yes. or a tangential move in a different direction. Uh, but isn't the first step then, if you want to communicate anything, this this uh, idea that oh we need to communicate the the danger of the system, we need to uh, communicate yeah. how species are going extinct, how there's an environmental. It's like everybody knows that. What well, you some, should be communicating well, is people, that we can't have this utopian thing anymore. Yeah. Nobody, even XR, is not computing the part. Uh, you know, they're not um, basically transmitting the information that the party is over. And the threat is uh, China and India are going to try and join the party that's just died. And no one will go there. No that's, one will discuss why, the crux why, of what we should be saying. Going not only to the Anthropocene, which means the human domination of the planet, we move towards Necrocene, which is right. a period of, of, of death, of, of, of death of other, other um, species, but also it will involve the death of, of humans because because of the distraction of the environment. And that would, but there are people who still deny these things. So there are climate deniers. Or oh, economists. There's un unemployment uh, financiers deniers. Do it. Yeah, yeah. Financiers uh, deny unemployment. It's something like as if it's something uh, just because he, uh, workers decide to be unemployed. They can't look for work hard enough. These people, there are many deniers. Even Trump, you know, Trump loves coal. So, some will say coal and he loves oil, but they, they, they are causing a certain amount of problems for the environment. 
I'll say. <laughs> That's yeah. an understatement. Uh, and in particular, climate change, yeah. and which is a major threat. There are climate change deniers. You've met them, I've met them. And we know some of them, yes. yes. So, We've, so, um, so therefore, yeah. the, the, you know, how, how it's difficult to, to reason with these people. And, uh, but I, think, I still think that, that at 72 years old, I have a certain amount of hope still I'm not thinking this, the, the necrocene is inevitable. It's, I think that, that, that we can slightly change direction. And if there are enough people who become, become aware of it, enough people who are conscious, and, and I, so I've been very inspired by very young people in particular, uh, so-called millennials, who are very aware of the problems and are actually trying to do something about it. My fear is that they are too small, that there are too few of them. Hmm. And uh, we may, work, but we have to try and move towards a lovely community, a community where, of a, where in which people share the good things of the earth, and where they have show a certain mutual aid and solidarity, and and uh, where they can, they, are, they they can fulfil themselves without having authorities, whether it's church or or, or state, controlling them. Hmm. Okay, so I want to ask you one uh, more thing, and then probably we should round yes. it off. But the, so the, the it seems like anarchy today, uh, the '60s generation, the basically the the anarchists of the '60s seem to have just decamped. There's one of the papers that wrote was called D- "Desert" or "Desert." Either way, it's a kind of double entendre. But um, They've they've just given up. I mean, like the Jane Fonda generation. They just went into the you know saying we can't do anything. But Jane about Fonda this. was never an anarchist, uh, right? Mm-hmm. But I mean, she's an example she, she, of, of she, an activist. Yeah, and then she, but she was she, very much part of the Hollywood and very much part. Of oh, but but uh, but that, she that exemplifies life. the thing yes, that she yes. she then just went into you know lifestyle and yes, fitness yeah. and yes, all exactly. the stuff that you can. Basically, it's withering down to this. As many, we, and, we, many. You, we're hopeless as individuals. We just have individual lifestyle choices, so we'll just wither down to that. Many rebels mm-hmm. from sixties just turned into capitalists, yeah. school entrepreneurs. Yeah. Some a few made it. Into big underfire, but the uh, the um, there are there are some sixties anarchists, including myself, who have continued, and they the, the, the anarchy is a great I would describe it as a great anarchism, which actually comes from Greek anarchos, means without a leader, without a ruler, the the word anarch, anarchism, and uh, particularly as we're in Greece now, you know it's quite quite important to remember that. That they were Greeks who thought it's possible to live without a ruler, without yeah. leaders. Yeah, they didn't only come up State. with democracy, they came up with anarchy. <laughs> yes, exactly. So yeah. if you look people, the whole, people ought to still be told that yeah. in school. <laughs> well, I tried to, try to show that is the case, and there are many anarchist traditions around the world, you know, within, within Buddhism, even within Catholicism, Christianity, and. Uh, but, and uh, Taoism in particular, I think Taoist, very Taoist, ancient yeah. Chinese way of thinking, that the, these have uh, 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 certain anarchist ideas, even within the Islam, but they're, um, but they're minorities. But anarch- anarchism, if you look at the history of anarchism, before the first person in the 19th century who called himself an anarchist, like Proudhon, mm-hmm. French, French uh, thinker, before that you can see in cer- certain libertarian anarchistic uh, a way of thinking and acting, and uh, the the um, the and since the twentieth century, nineteenth century, where you had the great anarchist thinkers like Proudhon and Bakunin and uh, Kropotkin. Yeah. Twentieth uh, uh, century, they take the others who. You better but, mention Emma Goldman or else and Emma Goldman. Get flown, flown and Emma <laughs> Goldman, who I, I included the <laughs> chapter on there, who at one stage considered the most dangerous woman in America. <laughs> yeah. Because you dared to say that uh, the the sexes should be should more be equal, equal. Yeah. yes, <laughs> and created as just that William Godwin did and the Mary Wollstonecraft a uh, uh, hundred years before, at least. Uh, but they they uh, they um, and the sort of so-called anarcha feminists, which are increasingly grown, in in uh, but they're not necessarily of the same stature as thinkers. 
But they. <coughs> oh, they, I've heard that out. <laughs> but the, the, uh, they're, they're, they're definitely. Well, well, anarchism, anarchism is, a, I will say, a great. like a river, a river anarchy, which has many tributaries. And you can see them in the most unlikely places. I think I think people live funny sort of anarchistic lives, but without really even being aware of what anarchism is. Yeah, and that's Which is probably the best way. <laughs> yes, yeah, but because you know, with the whole DIY movement and so on. But the, I wrote an epilogue to my to my book, which was then written in nineties, early nineties, the uh, Demand Impossible History of Anarchism. Written epilogue uh, about about eight or nine nine years ago. And trace the various t- different tributaries which have, have developed since then, since I first my book first came out, including anarcho primitivism, post anarchy, mm-hmm. uh, and um, other various tributaries. So it's it's a it's a it's a very very uh, um, uh, a very changeable tradition, and it it continues, and you'd actually find it in the most unusual places, lot and allotments. For instance, yeah, yeah. <laughs> the way whenever whenever that, people yeah. practice a mutual aid, yeah, community living, yes, yeah. living, and they, and they 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 they're slightly anarchistic. Yeah. Even the waiter here, he works in as a cafe in the summer. He goes, he goes and picks does the olive uh, uh, harvesting in the winter. But he says he loves it because everyone's so they so work it's together. A community work, but yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So well, whenever you see these things where people just do things together. Regardless of whatever the state says, regardless of government, yeah, that that is anarchistic, in my view, yeah, and 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 so it's much more amorphous and much more prevalent than people would say, think it is. I I didn't introduce you to the anarchists in Rithymno. There are a number of groups that are starting yes, anarchist yes. coffee houses and things well, like I that. I know that. I, I would actually. I think I took you to one. Oh, you introduced me. <laughs> yeah, I so. found another one. Okay. And they they've got they've got a they have food, they co-op, do food, co-op, food co-op also. Yeah, food co-op and organic and, food. But but I, they said that the government is making it harder and harder. They yes, keep on yeah. reclassifying what a co-op is and putting more and more onerous uh, legislation mm. against it to stop basically. Employee ownership. <laughs> They're exactly. against employee yeah, ownership. They are, and even though they have a sort of so-called left-wing government, it's quite a strong state in Greece, yes. yeah. where they they have been charted by the by the in, in the, the European Union, in particular the northern countries, yeah. uh, to repay this enormous debt, where uh, which is impo- virtually impossible, and so we have massive taxes, austerity. Yeah. So austerity. People actually still this winter people. Star died of starvation in Athens. Yes, yes, then, yes. Uh, people died of starvation in Athens mm-hmm. to pay back Deutsche Bank. Okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's correct. And also, you know, as many Greeks point out, Deutsche not uh, uh, during the war. They they just took all the Greek gold. Yeah, don't they, don't mention the Greek gold. <laughs> they actually they wrote Hitler wrote promissory notes I've saying really, repay it. But what they had to pay for this debt. Is probably roughly equivalent to what was taken. One hundred and ten billion. Yeah. yeah. They they owed and and Germany refuses to pay the rice um, the rice debt, even yes. though the international courts have said that they're still mm. liable for it. Yeah. So uh, anyway, that that's another subject, and let's not get onto the Germans because I've already done a bit too much German bashing. In other well, not just I'm not necessarily because they're very good German anarchists and and uh, uh, yes, they're definitely yes, people. Who, there, no, there, there are lots of people who have tried a different way of living. So yeah. I wouldn't say is it is not, not. I'm thinking more the, the German, yeah. uh, the the, the Bundestag and the, the, and the Deutsche the Bank, Bank yeah. and what it's done to Europe. The bank Europe is and supported by the state. Yeah. And so, I I think we're probably out of time, but the um, I would like to do this again because I would like to talk to you about Gebekli Tepe. So yes. you've been to Gebekli Tepe, yes. and uh, there's not enough time for it now. We've had one hour. <laughs> <laughs> but. Um, yeah, I would really like to cover all of that yes, because I uh, think there's so many lessons for us. In it's you know a message in a bottle for us. Yes. Uh, if we can interpret it, well, and it's so fascinating to try and interpret it. There's also the whole thing about Graham Hancock is yes. a friend of yours. You you were um, we lived we, we shared a house shared together a house together in the seventies. We also went to the first um, well the last actually uh, free festival nineteen seventy four. So and I get to in touch with him. Over the yeah. years, but uh, I slightly, slightly disagree with his idea of um, of this alternative archaeology, which he's been yes, practicing, yeah. which is very popular. 
Yes. Yeah. And had a huge following. Meant his some of his books were bestsellers, particularly the uh, Fingerprints, Fingerprints of the, of the Gods. Gods. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, just so uh, I I have sort of see a slight clear of um, of uh, of this uh, alternative archaeology, but I now I've, I've written a book called uh, uh, Lo Europe's Lost Civilization. Yes. Exploring the uh, mysteries of the megaliths. Yes. And that involved that was involved partly involved with sailing, and I sailed from the uh, from the from uh, Outer Hebrides in Scotland down to Malta. Yeah. And I try, try, I called in the various places to see the main megalithic sites and the megalithic, uh, which was near near Neolithic period uh, largely. Uh, you can see it traced down the west coast of of um, France and, and Portugal, Spain, and even to the foot of Italy. Uh, maybe that in Malta you have the earliest, until they found Kablaki Tepe, they had the earliest temples, which were about th yeah, 5,000 yeah. BC, yeah. Uh, which seemed to be a separate uh, they've development. They've predated them now. So based on, you see, the reason they were 5,000 BC was yes. because nobody would believe the antiquity. It was just a guess. Yeah. It? Now, since Gebekli Tepe, they've uh, said, look, these are contemporaneous with Gebekli Tepe. They? So yeah, we're sure. talking 10,600 10, years. Yeah, it yeah. was just reticence in mainstream... Yeah, but yeah. so so that would make them seven thousand years ago. Yeah, but it really puts the them probably in the ten thousand six hundred years ago. Yeah. So pre Parini. But anyway, this is we we're already going over into the next interview. Um, uh, but yeah, the Maltese sites. It, mm -hmm. it it means that they seafaring between. So it's if Quebecli Tepe wasn't bad enough mm -hmm. for mainstream archaeology, they have to now face yes that these other sites are probably contemporaneous and way older and it means there's sea travel going on and then that opens up a can of worms for their yeah. worldview. Because so, the general yeah. general view until recently was that the pe for people who first settled down that culture in certainly Northern Europe was about 5,000, 4,000 BC. Mm -hmm. uh, but in fact, the date has been totally... Prehistory is changing. You know? mm -hmm. Particularly, uh, as you say, Kablaki Tepe, but also I visited in, in Togia, Chattel, Chattel Huyuk, yes, which is yes. a very early settlement. Yeah. Uh, there's still some, some discussion about Kablaki Tepe, was it, was it, whether it was a monument made by nomadic hunter-gatherers, or by, by the beginning of the first settled people in yeah. Anatolia, but, uh, or in the Euphrates Basin. Yeah. That, is, to me, it's not really clear, but uh, the, the, some of the more... more um, Professional archaeologists are suggesting that the, uh, by Schmidt, Schmidt, I think, who discovered it. Yeah, Klaus German, Schmidt. Yeah, yeah that he, he was built by uh, uh, by nomadic hunter gatherers. Yeah, but it, it involved an enormous amount of energy. Yes, and, uh, well, well we, we, we're really spilling over into... Yes, anyway, anyway, I think we have to redate prehistory and we have to look relook at archaeology. And yes, the, the great yes. the, well, when I, my argument was was actually in in the in the um, Europe's lost civilization that uh, in fact the early the Neolithic people before the advent of the Bronze Age they they were largely communal largely egalitarian they had no leaders and it seems they even didn't have any personal private pro property. Yes. So all the, all the all the disasters we suffer from hierarchy and private property. And they, they and seem leaders. to appear around Gebekli Tepe. And uh, I would also like to ask about the, the ecology and the ecological mm -hmm. impact that, that you know, basically that first centralization had. But anyway, let's round off with just, would you just round off then with, say, um, we started off with what mm -hmm. baby boomers would say yeah. to millennials. Um, uh, what do you think, if you were a millennial now, would be saying to well, us? Well, I would say... Other than uh, to you us. bastards. The other way around. Other <laughs> yeah. way around. Well, they, yeah. say they, were, they, they probably would say, you know, we've ruined the plant. And, well, not all of them, because some don't, but a few do. And uh, uh, we, we have a very... Um, in, in, uh, we still maintain this belief that consumerism will bring happiness, will bring fulfilment. And as I said earlier, it doesn't. And, yeah. Uh, so... The millennials, uh, thinking millennials, either want to join the party, as you said, they would just want to carry on consuming until there's no longer nothing to consume. Their way of life in the West to continue. Meantime, 
places like India and Africa, even China, they, they can't get clean water or enough water. They can't get enough food. There'll be periodic famines. And, uh, but they're just, they would just want to carry on the party. But the more aware people will think, well, this is not, not necessarily the way forward because it would be bring this disaster. This is sort of what you talked about, doomsday situation. Mm. And uh, the uh, so I still would say that there are amongst millennials some people who have, have, have maybe just a few the ones I've been in contact with, in contact with me and others, that, that 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 there's another way, and another way is to try and live more in balance, more in harmony with nature, and create a more egalitarian, just and free society, which is, I think is possible. It's happened in the past, and it could be could be uh, developed on a larger scale in the future. Well, fantastic. I can't agree with you more. Um, so, yeah, I'll hold you to another interview, and thanks very much for this one. <laughs> well, it's a pleasure to talk about these issues.